Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us this afternoon. My name is Susan Ward, and I'm with the Bureau of Student Wellness at the New Hampshire Department of Education. I'm here with Granite State Children's Alliance Director of Victim Services and Quality Assurance, Nicole Ledoux. I'm also here with NHI CAC Task Force Investigator, Matthew Fleming. And today we will be discussing the importance of speaking to children about engaging in safe online behavior, the increase of reports, sites and apps to be aware of and how to keep your children safe. So I just wanna say thank you both so much, uh, Nicole and Matthew for joining us today. We really appreciate the time uh, for you taking the time out of your day and your uh, busy schedules to discuss these important topics and the dangers we might not even be aware of that are lurking behind our children's screens. So thank you. Welcome. You're welcome. And um, if we want to get the um, slides up. And here we have our presenters, um, Nicole Ledoux and her information. If you have any questions or need to contact her, um, we have her address, her phone number and her email. And then we also have Deputy Matt Fleming's information here. And it also has his address at the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, his direct line and his email address as well. So here's uh, some really important information if you need to contact them. So thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Um, yeah. Yeah, happy to be here. So, I mean, I'll start, I'll do, we'll just introduce ourselves and then we'll get right into it. Does that work for you, Susan? Sure. Okay. Um, my name is Nicole Adu. I'm the Victim Service Quality Assurance Director. It's up on your screen now. I'm from Granite State Children's Alliance. Granite State Children's Alliance um, is the umbrella organization for the Child Advocacy Centers here in the state of New Hampshire. Child Advocacy Centers do forensic interviews and follow-up services for children who um, are victims of uh, physical or sexual abuse or children who are witness to um, significant um, crimes such as a homicide or a very serious domestic violence issue. Um, we work very closely with law enforcement and prosecution on in the investigations of um, child abuse and neglect. Um, my background in the area is uh, comes from law enforcement, 23 years with Manchester Police Department, um, working on the last 10 of which I worked on uh, child abuse uh, related cases, domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking. Um, and so I'll let Matt introduce himself and then we'll get into um, our topic today. Sure, good afternoon, thanks for having me. My name is Matt Fleming. I'm an investigator with the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Uh, my background here in New Hampshire and law enforcement actually began in, in 1994. Uh, I worked in local law enforcement for 23, 24 years. Uh, most of that time was at the town of Bedford. I have 15 years of uh, investigative experience in uh, child sex abuse investigation, child sex crimes and internet crimes against children. I'm currently employed uh, through the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department as a special investigator there that works uh, for the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, which is a unique task force which is based out of Homeland Security's office in Manchester, uh, includes state, local, federal partners and county partners. Our job there is simply to uh, hunt down, identify, track and locate uh, people who exploit children via the internet and or people who are manufacturing child pornographic material, sex trafficking, or, uh, make, uh, or exploiting children through the internet resources. And so it's a very important task force group that I work for. We have funding that comes both from the state and the local federal and have existed since 1998. Um, and the work that we're doing there is extremely valuable to New Hampshire's children to protect them. And so Susan, that the reason that, um, you know, we were really excited to come on your presentation today is because we are, uh, and so Matt and I have known each other for many, many years, uh, over 20 years, we've worked cases together, uh, Bedford and Manchester touch each other, so, and kids travel, so we've worked quite a few cases together, um, but the thing that we think is really important for educators, student wellness personnel, parents, even students to understand is with this now remote learning that is going on in New Hampshire, and isn't that fantastic, the kids are able to still learn while we're in this um, kind of socially isolated situation, um, kids are spending a lot of time on the internet. Um, and not only are they spending a lot of time on the internet for their remote learning, but also their other activities that they do in life have been 
are on hold, right? There's no sports, there's no music lessons, there's no robotics, there's no dance theater, none of that is going on. And so a lot of that time um, that kids would normally be doing those things is now spending communicating with friends on internet, communicating with families on internet, gaming, right? We know that especially our um, preteens and teens love their gaming sites. Um, so some of that time that normally would be spent away from um, online activities is being spent online. And so we want to ensure that children, parents, educators, everyone who's interacting or uh, observing kids interact or controlling kids access um, online understands uh, the dangers that exist in the world of the internet, right? Um, and, and kind of also as an understanding of what's been happening in terms of internet related crimes since we've gone into this kind of lockdown situation. Um, and so Matt's really the expert on that. We just want parents, educators, kids, wh whoever the caregivers are to be very vigilant um, with their children's use of online um, resources. They're important to have. We want kids to be online. We want them to continue get ed to get educated. We want them communicating with their friends. That's good for their mental health, of course. Um, and even we don't have an issue with kids gaming. We just want them to do it safely. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Matt because he's really the expert on that. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting too, um, Nicole, you make a great point. We, we talk a lot about what is going on now today and what, what we're seeing this trending. And I wanna share some numbers today, not, not to scare people, but to make them more informed. I mean, the reality here is that we have to get more informed about what's going on. Uh, what's interesting about our task force group is we've been around since 1998. So this fight, and Nicole, you know this, this fight, we've been on the front lines of this fight for a long time. Um, you know, a lot of credit goes to the commanders of our task force. And we've, we've had several currently, uh, our current commander, John Paraki, who's a lieutenant at Portsmouth Police, has done a really fantastic job of, I like to say, moving the ball down the field, uh, to use a sports analogy, to really bring in more staff and to do more. So we have been looking at our numbers very carefully. We are concerned about what's going on. In an average world for us, we see roughly um, 60 cyber tips in a month period. And a lot of people are curious about what that really means and what that is. And so uh, quite simply, our task force operates because we receive complaints of concern, right? So some of those complaints of concerns come in through parents contacting their local law enforcement agency and saying, hey, we're worried about uh, some communication that we intercepted of our children or something that they're doing online. Uh, other places it may come in is directly from law enforcement itself reporting something that they uncovered during the course of a of separate investigation. Uh, and then the third and probably where we see the most, which is where we see the bulk of our tips in a month's period, come from the cyber tip line through the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, all of which this information will be putting up on at the end for everybody to see as far as how to contact and, and, and get more information. But uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Kids, which is a, a group that most people know for the missing kids, they know them for Adam Walsh and all the work that's been done there involving um, you know, the, the sexual and, and abuse of children, also work with us to collect information from internet service providers. So internet service providers uh, here in New Hampshire and across the country uh, gather information when there are reports of concern. So in an average month here in the state of New Hampshire, we'll probably see about 60 complaints come in of some sort of concern. It could be anything from a child receiving obscenity to a child being enticed to somebody transmitting or distributing or manufacturing child pornographic material or child sex abuse imagery. So for that reason alone, they're constantly working with us. Uh, our, our task force runs through the Portsmouth Police Department who applied for the grant back in 1998 and still manage it to this day. And our task force members spread across the street, uh, across the street through about 90 affiliate agencies uh, through every law enforcement uh, portal that you can imagine here in New Hampshire from state, local, county, federal. So in that average month, we see about 60. Uh, since January 1, when things have started to ramp up and the concerns of, of COVID started to become more apparent, our numbers did start to grow. Um, recently, uh, we looked since January 1, we can tell you that cyber tips are on the rise. Uh, that normal 60 in a month is, is eclipsing well over 200. Uh, we haven't seen all of April yet uh, because we're right in the middle of it. And we won't really know the true effect of that until we get through April and well into March. Uh, and then maybe even beyond because there is a delay in some of the reporting. I, I think what's probably more concerning and what parents really need to understand is that the, because of that, there's three other categories that we're kind of assessing right now. One is enticement. Our kids getting enticed as a result of internet co communities increasing their traffic from 
a stay at home order here in New Hampshire and, and throughout the country. And, and the fact is yes. So in New Hampshire, we have uh, well over 100% increase in enticement cases. Uh, we've seen well over a 30% in obscenity cases, which is uh, material being distributed to kids without request, uh, which is sexually explicit and graphic in nature and many times involves a sexual act. And then of course, because these two categories are climbing, overall possession from our online predators is up over 85% as well here in the state of New Hampshire. So it's very alarming. It's alarming to start with uh, to most people that we talk to when we're out publicly speaking, uh, but to talk to them about what's going on in the world in which we are asking people to stay at home and then res resort to just using internet-based platforms to communicate. Um, this is a number that we have to watch carefully. Our task force has to continue to spread the word through presentations like this and having conversations with our local law enforcement partners. So I, I thought um, today what we could do to sort of get people to understand a little bit better about what they can look for is to talk a little bit about those categories in a roundabout sense. So for example, people don't really understand what online enticement is and how it happens. And I think in the truest sense, online enticement is gonna happen through primarily through social media applications. And so you're gonna see that happen through everything from TikTok, Snapchat, um, you know, the Facebook, um, to uh, YOLO, to all the different platforms that kids are running from. And additionally, what's included is that we're going to see um, online enticement take place in online portals where people can communicate in video. So things like Kik um, or Skype, or even in a Zoom capacity where people can communicate. Remember, our online predators are out there. And now we've taken a pool of of about what we used to estimate was about 45 million kids a day. And we've pretty much put them all on the internet, made them available to them. So they're going to go to the social media applications that are most available to kids to try to communicate. Sort of the running anecdotal joke that we use, which really isn't funny, but is true, is that predators don't go to predator.com to talk to kids. They go where the kids are gonna be. And pre-internet, they went to parks and places where kids would hang out and play. And now, those kids aren't in the parks. They're not at places to play. They're on the internet. So that's those, those are the locations. And we don't want people to forget that those locations are going to include gaming sites, which is a big population of what parents are using to help keep the kids busy. And I get it. Um, parents are working from home, teaching from home, and then trying to find five minutes to maybe collect their thoughts. Uh, that's pushing kids out to those platforms to use. Our predators know that. Uh, what people don't think about in our world is, is that the predators and the people that we're hunting down, the people who exploit children are everyday people. I mean, we have a vision in our mind that it is somebody who um, lives in their basement and eats pizza all day long and plays video games and never leaves the basement. But the sad reality is that although we have arrested people like that in, in these particular investigations, uh, we arrest moms and dads, police officers, firefighters, people who make your coffee, people who cook your pizza, the people who deliver your packages. Uh, people who have kids, people who are doing homeschool learning as well, and they are aware of what's going on and they're using that to their advantage. And so we have to be uh, more vigilant than ever. So I think the first thing we should do is talk about some of those flags that people should consider when you're talking about online enticement cases here uh, in New Hampshire and abroad. And, and the first thing is in online enticement, uh, it's going to be a grooming process. Our Online offenders are, are not just going to immediately uh, engage in online chats. In fact, in some of these cases, the online enticement began, began long before uh, the stay at home order and these kids were already communicating with unknown people and sharing way too much information to start with. And now that they're online and home all the time, their availability has gone up, which has made it much easier for the online um, predators to, to operate and to collect more and more information about these kids. So really uh, what we wanna talk about is how how they're sharing that information, what they're saying, and, and again, and what we want them to do when they use this type of material and applications. And so first and foremost, all of these applications require a, a grooming process. So it's not gonna be an instant request for material. It's usually gonna take place over time through one of the applications. So for example, if a child is online and playing in a gaming application and they're having communication with uh, unknown people, uh, they're just gonna slowly gather information about their at-home habits, who we live with, how old they are, um, the types of things they've done in the past. Most of those conversations will spin into things about if they've ever dated before, if they've ever engaged in sex before, or taken a picture of themselves before. And in some cases, it'll start as simple as just send me a regular picture of you. And I think one of the things that makes it simpler for kids to do that is because we've desensitized that not only publicly with television, but we've also desensitized that at home with 
mom and dad and all their friends taking social media application photos and posting them and creating sort of a normal, right? So if, if a child sees a, a mom or a dad jump in the vehicle and go driving down the road and not put their seatbelt on speed and text while they drive, what is it that we're teaching our kids to do when they get in a vehicle? And so it's the same thing with the internet, right? We need to talk to our kids about what we're going to be willing to share and what it is that we shouldn't be sharing. So when using social media applications, some of the red flags that are going to come up because of online enticement are going to be long-term um, communication with people that are going to start grooming. And these conversations are going to be with online screen names that kids are uh, they're familiar with, but mom and dad aren't. So one of the first things that we're asking parents to do is start talking to your kids about the applications they're running on, uh, talk to them about the screen names and the people they're chatting with, and start restricting those groups to groups of friends that they can officially say they're familiar with. And it's not just because you know the kid online, you have to know these kids. These kids are out of school, they're missing their friends, they know who their friends are, it's easy for a mom or dad to log on and call a friend over the phone and say, let's get your kids screen names. Let's get these kids into one group so we know who we're talking to, as opposed to exposing them to the entire environment of the internet and letting the kids pick. Um, kids are easy targets and they wanna make friends and people come offering all kinds of gifts. And in the online platforms, it's simple. They can, um, they can offer all kinds of things to kids. You know, the gamers are easy targets because they're on all the time. Uh, they're always looking for uh, online gaming uh, tokens and things that they can be sent to them via gaming. And when that happens, they can make instant friends and sometimes with the wrong people. So those are some simple red flags for people to consider that are, that are gonna be out there. And I, and I would say to you this, um, one of the things that we typically see is that when online communication begins and the grooming process starts, it goes from the kids being very public with what they're doing to very private in a short period of time. So they might be using those applications and playing online in the room in front of everybody, but then for some reason it slowly starts making its way out of that public environment and starts moving into our room and into a, a private space. And so one of the ways to defeat that is to just set some great ground rules at home about that stuff. So for example, um, asking the kids that if they're gonna use online gaming and they're gonna take time during the day to do that when they've done their schoolwork, it's simple to put those in public locations, turn off the private um, earbuds and stuff and make them start talking out loud so you can hear what they're saying, hear what's going on in the game and sort of follow along. I also encourage parents just to try to play. I mean, right. you know, it's, it's, not, it's not fun. When my son was younger, I used to get beat all the time. Um, but, you know, you get on there and you play and you learn the games uh, and you start interacting and get a better understanding of how the games function because everyone is going to be different, too. And uh, I think parents forget that these kids can chat in these games so they can chat offline, they can chat online and they can do that through the gaming portals. And typically what we find is, is that our online predators will use one platform to connect, but then we'll go offline to continue the conversation, whether it be through a third party device like a cell phone or internet through email, uh, something along those lines. So those are some things that are that are really important. And I think- so, Matt, ahead, I, just want, I just wanna point out, I think a really good rule of thumb, and I have a tween at home and I know Matt's raised some kids too, is that you don't online communicate with anyone that you've never seen face to face. Right. Because a lot of times kids will say, well, it's a, it's a friend of my friend. It's if you don't know the person in person, there's no social media, gaming, any online communication with that person at all. And that those devices that Matt spoke of at bedtime, when it's time for the family to shut down, those access to those devices is removed. Whether you have to turn off your internet or change the password or actually physically remove access to those devices. But when parents can't be aware of what's going on because you're sleeping or something else is going on, access to your cell phones, um, your gaming devices, that is removed. That's a great point, Nicole. And I think it's also important that people understand that kids, um, so parents have been fooled quite a bit in our investigations and, and, and it's, not because they don't have the best intentions, they just don't understand the technology. So they think that, oh, if I take my child's cell phone away, um, that will uh, disrupt their ability to connect on the internet. And also I can go to bed at night and not have to worry. If it can collect a Wi-Fi, so iPods, iPads, iTouches, laptops, tablets, Kindles, notebooks, it can drop an app. And if it can collect an app, it can get online. And you just have to understand that everything that is electronic these days has access to the outside world. Also understand that if you're living in more of a um, urban environment as opposed to residential, um, your kids can jump onto their neighbor's Wi-Fi or somebody else's Wi-Fi network to communicate as can they to yours. And so for that reason alone, uh, password sharing of Wi-Fi networks and also 
um, having a great relationship with your neighbors who live close to you about your internet usage with your kids and what you're going to allow their kids to do with your internet as well is super important because we want to make sure we're protecting not just our own kids, but the kids that live in and around us. You know, statistically, if we look at what's going on with online enticement nationally, uh, the National Center has, has, has collected a lot of great data from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Kids. And they estimate that about 82% of our online enticement predators are going to be males, 9% will be females, and then another 9% of those just could not be gender determined because the online predators were never identified. And it's hard to tell if an online predator is really who they say they are. And Nicole makes another great point. We want to see the face of the person. And, but it's a great reminder to tell the parents that a face alone is not enough because our online predators collect images of kids every day. So they can pose as anybody they want to be at any age range through any online portal. It's the real either face-to-face -face conversation that they previously had with that person or they physically know that person and have talked to them and collected their screen name because at the end of the day, um, the people that we are hunting are very talented. Uh, they exist because they are determined to gain access to kids and they will take every single step that they can to do that. And uh, we used to say um, that we've seen it all and we don't say that anymore. In fact, the only thing we say now is that we're not surprised uh, because their ability to gain access to children is unparalleled in a world like this. So um, definitely need people to, to be mindful of that. Um, one thing that we've learned too through our national data is that uh, nearly almost every child that's been interviewed as a result of one of those in the online enticement cases, they reported that they never met the person prior to creating some sort of online relationship with them. So it wasn't that they knew that person previously. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the work that Nicole's group's doing uh, with, the, with, the, with the Children's Alliance and Child Advocacy Centers, they will tell you that, um, you know, it's, was it 90% Nicole are known to the victim, right? There's only about 10% that drive around in that vehicle that pull a kid into the car. Whereas I would say online, less than that. Yeah. I would say less than that. Most kids are, uh, when they're sexually assaulted, the, the perpetrator is known to the victim. And so when we say known to the victim, if it's someone that they now know online, that's known right. to the victim. That's not a stranger. They've developed an online relationship. They may think they're talking to a 14-year-old girl and they're talking right. to a 50-year-old man, but they have developed a relationship with that person. Right. And then, and then conversely, and you're right. And so then conversely, when you look at online enticement, you have an entire population of kids that are looking and talking and sharing very intimate uh, private images and sexual images with people they've never met in person. I like to tell people that what's going on on the internet right now is, is really 21st century sexual abuse, which is that we don't have to be in the same room anymore to exploit or sexually assault a person. We can do that right over the internet from millions of miles away or from 100 yards down the street from our neighbor. We just don't know. Uh, so when we look at online enticement too, I think a very another important stat for parents to be mindful of is that when we look at online enticement, the median age of where it's happening is 15, but it's anywhere between one and 17 that they're collecting this data from. So age one to 17. Now, if you looked at sextortion, which is sort of the, um, the ramped up version of online enticement, where it goes from enticing a person to talking to then saying, hey, I have a picture of you now. And when I take this picture, I'm going to show everybody unless you give me more. Those numbers drop down between about 10 to 17. So we have kids as young as 10 years old being extorted on or sextorted via the Internet. And that's occurring because they're they're very concerned that someone's going to find out. They're scared they're going to get in trouble. The, um, the threats are very serious. And so for that reason alone, um, they continue to participate in the conduct, which is why they are so vulnerable at ages you know, 10, 11, and 12. Here's what we're also seeing that's trending that I really want parents to think about. You know, When you're talking about a high school population of kids that we've asked to stay home that are in the teens, the early teens, they're just sort of getting into sexuality. They're just sort of having these conversations, right? They're just sort of starting to become who they want to be in this world. And they are doing that one-on-one -on -one and meeting with kids, right? They're having connections. They're going out to parties. They're meeting up. There's all kinds of things happening. Now we force them inside. So a lot of the communication that we are seeing now is communication between two um, willing minors who are trading images back and forth. This was going on prior to COVID, but it's going on more now than ever. And Although um, there's no criminal intent involved by the children involved, they are committing criminal acts un unknowingly by manufacturing material, which would be considered uh, child pornography in our world. And we are getting cyber tips from that. And we are having con conversations with families and alerting them of that. Parents really need to have a conversation with their kids and say, hey, um, this type of material is not only not safe, 
and you never know who you're really sharing it with. But internet service providers look at everything that is shared. So every time a person uploads an image or a file, it is scanned by a service provider. And if that service provider has that account listed as a minor because they registered it as their proper age and date of birth, it is going to be flagged. And when that is flagged, we are going to be alerted and we're going to be having tough conversations. And, and as I've always said, there's no getting the images back. You know, sharing images once they're out there are almost impossible to recover. And victims of these cases don't realize how bad it is until they're 30 years old and they're still getting letters from the U.S. Attorney's Office saying, hey, we found your photo again. Would you like to come in and testify again for the, you know, 10th time or 100th time because it was posted out there? Um, you know, I know that we live in a different world and I know that the internet is a great place for kids to go to, but uh, the boundaries haven't been uh, well set for them. And now it's more important than ever to set those with families. So that's important to talk about. Um, I think one of the ways we can do that and, and do it effectively at homes is with younger populations, it's easy. You should be setting up contracts with your kids to start with about how we're going to use uh, social media platforms and the internet and our cell phones. And, and it really is great because we're in a remote learning world where we can actually introduce that as part of our lesson, right? Hey, today we're going to talk about internet. We're going to talk about internet citizenship and cyber citizenship and what the rules are going to be and have kids go through a contract that you create at home, set some times. Like during the day, during these time frames, we're only going to do internet uh, stuff for school work. These are the websites we're going to use. And then in after hours, uh, we're not just going to stay on our devices to pass the time. We're going to get outside. We're going to have fitness and get involved with other things, go out with our kids, and then have a time frame where kids can actually log on the internet um, and use that for social media interaction and gaming. I'm not a big believer in saying to everybody shut it off completely because that's not the world that they live in. And shutting them off, and Nicole will tell you this from her experience with uh, her time in law enforcement and her time over at at the Child Advocacy Group and the Grand State Children's Alliance is that it's not gonna go away. So if we don't allow them to have it, teach them how to use it carefully, we're just creating a recipe for disaster because they're going to gain access to it. And then we're in a worse problem than we had before, right? We don't just wanna unleash these kids to the internet without any education. And we don't wanna hold it back because they're gonna find ways in. Then the internet is not the best place for them to go and explore and learn on their own. If you asked a kid to go to the internet and learn about sexual education, that's probably the worst place they could go, right? because they're gonna get it from all the wrong platforms and all the wrong information. So we have to deliver this stuff in a safe way. So here's some things you can also do. Um, main locations within your home during remote learning and social distancing is a good thing to do. So just tell them, hey, look, anytime you're gonna communicate, it's gonna be done in the public places within the home where we can see what's going on. It's for your safety and the safety of everybody in this home. Um, setting up those times, as I said before, um, Having a difference between school time and gaming times, I think is very appropriate and also having good habits as adults. So, you know, you, you need to put your own personal device down. You need to set some guidelines with how you're gonna use your communication um, and, and stop texting your kids from the living room who are upstairs working on their schoolwork to come downstairs and, and get on your feet and go up there and see what's going on um, and get that communication going in public areas are, are all things that I think that need to happen. Um, we're not, we're not in this alone. Everybody here can do this if we work together on this. And I think that it's critical now more than ever that parents understand that. We've been saying this for a long time and we were worried about an environment where this would become our world. And now it's here and we're, we're really trying to get the word out because um, it only takes a minute for a kid to send an image, right? Seconds. And then it can change their life forever. And we don't want that to happen. So. Um, hey, Matt, yeah, can you, yeah, go ahead, can you, go. um, Maybe uh, just give, because you know this better than me, but give the, I'm sure we have some education people on the line and um, parents, like what are some of the apps you're catching a lot of cases with right now that kids are really using? Because I have to be honest with you, like I use Facebook and yep. Instagram, but right. I'm also almost 50 years old, right? I don't think right. that my tween really wants either one of those apps, but I won't let them have anything. I won't right. let them have anything, right? So what are the kids using that parents well, and teachers should be listening for to say, yeah, that might be concerning? It's a great question too, because you, we're, we're victims of our own kids. So kids will come to parents and say, oh, I, I would like to um, get on social media. They start reaching that age, which is always a question we get, like what is the most appropriate age? And I would tell you that varies from kid to kid based upon their, um, based upon their maturity. But um, parents are using those apps, right? They're using Facebook and they're using, um, they're using Instagram because that's really the world that they're in. That's the type of stuff they do. They like to monologue out these long posts and follow what other families are doing. 
kids do that because you ask them to, but they're not on those applications. They're not communicating there. They're just doing it because you asked them. And if they make you their friend on Facebook, well, now they're following your social media and they don't have anything to worry about. And it's a false positive for parents. But what we're seeing the kids navigate to is things like TikTok, right? So they love to put on these um, great little short clip music videos, similar to what Vine used to offer. Uh, they also like to go to Snapchat, which is probably the bulk of the place where kids live. Why? Because Snapchat allows you to create an environment where you can send messages and they disappear automatically and you don't have to worry about uh, somebody discovering those messages within your household. Uh, parents should know that Snapchat is one of those applications that just needs Wi-Fi. It doesn't need a cell phone specifically or a cell phone bill to operate. And, and, and quite honestly, they can lock out certain categories in there and do a section called for your eyes only, which even if they do save something, parents won't be able to get into. So parents should be looking at things like how is their, is their child using their Snapchat? Are they connected with their kids on Snapchat? And are they a, a friend of their kids on Snapchat where they can look at their story and their timeline? Much like that with other applications like Kick, for example, which um, used to be based out of Alberta, Canada. It's now moved to the US. Uh, law enforcement as a whole kind of cheered a little bit when uh, they closed in Canada and we thought they were gone. Uh, they were really leading the pack with uh, cyber related tips here in New Hampshire for a while because there's a lot of content streaming on there that was alarming. Um, when they closed down and they reopened in the US, we got sad, but um, Kick allows kids to chat. Uh, they allow, it allows them to, uh, to text, to talk uh, through video messages, take random dates. So parents should be talking about the pros and cons in those types of applications and not be, not be using them if they're not right for their kids. And quite honestly, they really don't need three or four different chatting apps if they're talking on Snapchat with their friends. And so I always tell parents, limit the number of applications you're allowing into the home because it just allows more opportunity for the kids to be made a victim. Um, other places that we're seeing kids go are things like ChatStep, which is just another chat application. Uh, YOLO, which is a variation of Snapchat. Um, they're also going on to YouTube channels and other locations like YouTube, like Skype to talk to people. So we should be talking to our kids about what the value in each platform is and picking the ones that are appropriate. I also strongly recommend that parents actually go to Google and put in that particular app's name and then try to see if you can find a YouTube video or a short video on how it functions because most of these applications uh, have some sort of an operational video that you can see or, or an online review. And, and that online review will tell you about what that application shares about your personal information. Because keep in mind, a lot of these applications require location services to be enabled. And that location service gives away where the child currently is. And that can be super dangerous in this environment because although we believe everybody's at home, not everybody's home, and you have essential personnel out there working and their kids are home alone, remote learning and chatting on the internet and are a high probability to give away their location and have somebody show up at that particular location. So uh, location services within those apps is critical to understand as well. Um, and there are a lot of apps out there, right? There are also apps that are designed to allow kids to hide their communication, things like a spy calculator, which looks like a regular calculator and works like a regular calculator and yet if you put the right collection of uh, code digits in that you preset on the, on the calculator, it'll open up a hidden vault of pictures, text messages, and PDF files and videos. So parents really need to scrub the phone with their kids, go through the phone, look at what the apps are that they're running and make a determination if it's appropriate. On the gaming side, it's a gambit, but one of the most popular gaming places that the kids are going right now is either Steam or Discord. Steam and Discord are much like the same. They are basically gaming platforms online kids can buy uh, credits for, and they can go on there and upload different games and play on a virtual platform. But like any other virtual platform, it allows the kids to chat or video chat or collect uh, chat messages. And so uh, those, those companies do report to law enforcement when they see reports of concern uh, and parents should be mindful of that. And probably one more place I love to mention, although it has gone down a little bit, uh, but we suspect that that'll come back up again is Tumblr. Uh, it's spelled T-U-M-B-L-R. It is basically the kid's version of Facebook. And the content there was very explicit at one point. Uh, Tumblr did a nice job of bringing a lot of that stuff down, but it does uh, still reappear there from time to time. It can be somewhat explicit. Uh, and parents need to know that uh, applications like that that allow kids to navigate in uh, usually give them an opportunity to click a link or a portal to take them somewhere else to talk to online people. 
Um, and I think lastly, one thing I think, Nicole, that we should probably mention to parents is that parents are unaware of how the dark web works and what that is. Um, and unfortunately, uh, most people access the dark web through one portal. Uh, specifically, they love to go through the Tor network, T-O-R, it's short for the onion router. And uh, when they access the, the Tor network, it opens up a world that is um, horrific. Uh, there's a, a large volume of nefarious activity, everything from ordering drugs to, to buying child pornography, to um, viewing child pornography, to, to um, ordering hitmen if you want to. So uh, parents really need to do their homework and start looking at these devices. If a parent finds their child on the dark net, they immediately should call law enforcement because there's no reason yeah. at all right. for any child right. to ever be on the dark net. There's no right. reason for anybody who's not doing something that isn't criminal to be on the dark net. Yeah. <laughs> right. And you know, you, I'm actually glad you said that. So one thing we want people to take away from this today is what do you do? Like, so what am I supposed to do if I see or see something that happened? Here's what you need to do as a parent. The first thing you need to do is talk with your child about what's going on and get a handle on kind of feel for what's going on. And then you need to report it to your local law enforcement. So a lot of people will call our task force in some way, shape or form, whether it's sending an email or um, trying to send a message to our Facebook page or trying to send a message to us through an online portal. That's not the best recommendation. So uh, always local law enforcement because they know how to contact us. And we are really a force multiplier. We are going to be involved. Um, we are gonna be there to help that local agency navigate that complaint, but we need to get that complaint started with local law enforcement. The other place that we love people to go to, which is a really great start, and we're gonna put this information up later on as well, is the cyber tip line. So if you're talking about an internet related complaint, when you click that box that says report abuse, um, it's a cyber tip essentially, but the cyber tip line at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Kids has an actual tip line. You can click, you can type your information and you can send it. You can even send it about a third party if you're concerned about another child in another family that might be involved in illicit conduct. It's, it's dangerous for them. It's really no difference than filing a complaint with the Department of uh, Children and Family Services, right? Like DCYF, you could just you can launch a complaint with them. You can do the same thing through the cyber tip line for the internet. So we want parents going to those portals and making those complaints. Here's what we don't want them doing. We don't want them uh, forwarding it to their own personal email. We don't want them uh, printing out pictures or downloading things or saving things to devices. If you're not sure what to do and you think it's time sensitive, contact law enforcement right away. Because uh, what they don't realize is that in many cases they are either altering evidence or they are committing uh, crimes. So if you take stuff that could be considered illicit material and start forwarding it around, you could commit a crime yourself by mistake. And we don't want that to happen. We also don't want to alter the evidence in its original state. And we really want to get a look at what was going on at the time it was received. So the best thing you can do as a parent, even though my, being a parent myself, the hardest thing to not do is to not lose your patience and get upset. Just remain calm, try to find out what's going on and then make the phone call. And, and that's where we're going to really get involved. So you make a great point about what are the kids doing in that network? What are they doing there, right? So who are you going to call? And we want the parents to contact the appropriate law enforcement agency and get things going. So Matt, one more thing that you mentioned earlier when we were kind of talking, talking offline um, is a lot of educators and uh, even families are spending time on Google Chats and Zoom yep. and the other kind of face-to-face, -face, um, you know, uh, virtual uh get together sites and we're hearing a ton about zoom bombing and, and google chat bombing yeah. so um you said there's really no way for you guys to prevent that and so what should people be talking about over those or how should they control what they're discussing over those type of virtual meetups um to kind of prevent any 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 issues sure great great question too on that one because um, really, I would, I always suggest with people, and, and this is tough, right? We're asking teachers to do something that is unprecedented. And then in return, we're going to ask families to do the same thing. So in an unprecedented world on both sides of the, of the coin here, it's, it's put a lot of burden on them to think about what they're doing when we just are trying to struggle to get through the day. So Zoom has become a great platform for all of us. We're using it here today. And like anything in this world, people realize when they can exploit something. And so when the internet was created, right, it was great. Yay, we have the internet and we can use it. And then people started finding ways to exploit children on the internet. It's the same thing is happening with these virtual platforms that we're communicating to conduct business and to teach kids. And the problem is, is that these networks are not secured and they're not secured to prevent from online attacks of people getting in and gathering information. So what we're recommending you do is that you do not share information over these platforms that you wouldn't normally share publicly out in front of other people. Those types of communication need to be private one-on-one, -on -one, either in-person 
conversations that you're sharing it or direct emails that you feel are confident through either a virtual private network or you know uh, another platform that is not something that is a public network that can be hacked. They're doing it from right out in front of people's houses. They're jumping into networks and they're looking to gather information. In some circumstances, they're just looking to disrupt, right? They're looking to um, try to um, disrupt what's going on so that they can interfere with what's going on with the remote learning and remote business. And in other cases, they're just doing it to exploit people and gather their information. So what we're suggesting they do is limit what you're putting online in, in live communication. Don't share personal information, dates of births, social security numbers, addresses, phone numbers, account information, um, where people specifically live. Save that for private direct messaging through either uh, a text message or a conversation with a person. Keep them off the applications. Keep them off of the um, off of these video chats because they, they can be uh, subject to some sort of a hack. And in many cases, by the time we identify who it is, they are long gone and the information's already been used to exploit them. So do we have, are there any questions that are coming in or? I, um, I just wanted to add, um, I, have, I have goosebumps listening to, <laughs> to this. Um, because it's um, very eye-opening as a parent. Um, it's also um, scary. And one thing I actually learned last year, I, I didn't know this before last year, was that if you have a child, a teenager under 18, and he or she is dating a teenager, somebody under 18, and they share explicit photos with each other, that, and they have that on their device, they are, owning child pornography. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yep. It, it was so shocking to me yeah. because obviously it's not criminal intent, but at the same time, it's on their device. Yeah, and so that's a big part of, um, again, what we were talking about before we work. You know, parents are doing a really good job in New Hampshire. Obviously, it, it, we can see that, right? The social distancing thing seems to be working and parents are keeping these kids away from each other. So these kids are using their platforms to the best of their ability to reconnect and, and continue their relationships. Um, what kids don't understand is that, and, and we do try very hard to educate more than, um, um, you know, bring these kids into the juvenile justice system. That's not the goal of trying to stop this, but it's dangerous conduct to be involved in because we're really not sure that when we trade images with another uh, minor willingly that they're actually going to keep that material, right? I often joke about this. It's not funny, but if a boy sh gets a picture from a boy or a girl that sent to them that's sexually explicit, the first thing they do is they show their friends. That's what boys do, right? Because they're proud of themselves because they got it. They've always wanted a picture and they got it. Mm -hmm. Conversely, girls really don't. They sort of sit on it and hold the image and keep it. And then when the girls are upset with the boy or the girl that they're involved with, then they show everybody. But eventually, whether that's the circumstance or not, these images get out there. And once they're out there, there's no getting them back. The problem is, is kids are prohibited by law to take sexually explicit images of themselves involved either in sexual acts or the, uh, their genitals or, or, or a lewd exhibition of them are included as a focal point in the image. When they do that, they're actually manufacturing child pornographic material. And now they're committing all kinds of crimes by transmitting it and sending it to one another and then possessing it and holding on to it or distributing it to others. So parents have to talk to kids about the reality of that and the ramifications of that and that they can't be doing that type of conduct. What's tough in, in New Hampshire and in a lot of other states is that at the age of 16, they can legally consent to engaging in sex, but they cannot conduct that type of uh, activity via the internet under the law in New Hampshire until they're 18 years of age or older. So you can't have a sexual conversation with your, with your boyfriend or girlfriend if you're 18 and they're 16, because the 18 year old is committing adult crimes. Right. Conversely, if you know, if they trade images, the 18 year old is now in possession of child pornography and the 16 year old is probably being viewed as a victim. So it's important that parents talk to these kids about the ramifications of that and the gravity of what they're, they're actually doing. I mean, you know, it's, it's dangerous, dangerous conduct. And then, you know, we don't think about what happens to these devices after we want the next phone, right? So, oh great, the iPhone 12's out, the iPhone 13's out. What did you do with your old phone? Where did those images go? And in some cases, we have kids backing their phones up to an iCloud account owned by their parents. And we're getting alerts from places like Apple and other applications saying, hey, by the way, we found child pornography. Wow. And so now we're knocking, we're knocking on the door of those homes. Yeah. 
and, and, and kids don't even understand this, and I, most adults, um, anytime you upload anything, meaning anytime you put anything into the cloud, you put it into an email, you transmit it over the internet, that upload happens. A very special uh, photo DNA is used. Uh, programs and algorithms are run against that, and that stuff is viewed. And if it is flagged as potential child pornographic material based upon a number of things, local law enforcement is alerted through the task force. So we get these calls. And as I said, you know, we're, we're on pace um, to push well into the 200s in a 30 day period. So things are skyrocketing right now. 200, 200 reports. Yes. Yeah. We're well, we're going to be probably well over that by the time this is over, uh, just in the month of April alone. Scary stuff going Staggering. on. Staggering. It is scary. Um, so I think, I also, oh, go ahead. And I, I wanted to say this because there are, uh, I'm sure a lot of adults watching this, whether you're 16 or you're 35, once you send that picture out, you have lost complete control of yep. it. You have no idea where it's going. You, you may feel like you trust the person that you're sending it to, but you have no control. And so that's some ultimate trust because that picture can go from that receiver's phone to the internet in a, a matter of seconds. And once it's on the internet, it can go anywhere. And so, and you can never get it back. And we hear that from, especially from, um, children who have been victimized through child sexual abuse images, that the repeated victimization of that picture, even 10, 15 years after the actual act happened, um, showing up on the internet and people still viewing it years and years later is, is, is really horrific for them. So even as adults, we really have to think about what we're doing with our, with our images when we, when we send them off. Because once right. you press send, you have no control. This has definitely else. been an eye opener. Um, and I know you have some resources um, that we can share as well. Um, but this has definitely been such an eye opening conversation. And I'm so glad that we're having it because, um, you know, I, I'm actually going to ba go back and rewatch this because I think there were so many points and I was taking a little bit of notes. But um, I, I think I might have this conversation again with my child. I've already had some of this conversation with him, but I think it's important. Um, it's been a little while, but I think it's important, especially now to go back and review it and even maybe show him some parts of this video um, to really get him to realize that, um, you know, there are predators out there that he may not even be aware of. So, so thank you for sharing all of this. I think Matt made a really great point. Um, for educators too, that, you know, this is a conversation you can have when you're educating kids, right? You're educating through the internet. So having a baseline conversation and, you know, we'll leave it to parents to talk about sexting and things like that, but having a baseline safety conversation with kids about, hey, we're on the internet now and we're doing this uh, virtually. And I know you're doing a lot virtually. So let's talk about maybe what we shouldn't share when we're doing things virtually. And, um, you know, what information we shouldn't put it out on the internet, what's safe and what's not safe, and talk a little bit about really only connecting with people that you physically know, that you have physically in-person met, and, and that there are predators out there, and you don't want to connect with people that you really don't know, even if they say they're a friend of a friend, you know, you want to be careful for your own safety, um, and the safety of everyone that lives in your house. Yeah, great point, Nicole, and, and you know, it's a, Susan, you're right, it's a conversation you have with your kids today, it's a conversation you have with your kids next week, and the week after that. Um, and I say that because we know statistically that one in 33 kids are gonna receive a, an aggressive sexual solicitation where a person's gonna call them on the phone, ask to meet them somewhere, send them mail, money, or gifts. That's happening here in New Hampshire. So we just can't put our heads in the sand and check a box as a parent and say, oh, I had the conversation, it's tough, check, it's done. It's not done. Uh, most parents have a hard enough time having a conversation with their kids about sexual education and sexual boundaries and, and how to be safe with that stuff. They aren't even thinking about this one. I always like to use the example of my daughter who's now 21 years old. Uh, she really is a fantastic kid. And um, I was teaching uh, this particular similar type of program at a school, at her school. And um, I was teaching it over a range of dates and uh, she must've seen the same presentation four or five times. And it was her senior year as she popped in and I was teaching it again. And I, I said to her at the end of the class, what are you doing in here? Are you just skipping out on this, you know, something else to be here and sort of giving yourself a chance to do something else. And she goes, you know what, dad, the, the only reason that I'm here right now is because I needed to be reminded. I want to be reminded every day how dangerous this stuff is. And I, it took me back. Uh, and I, and I thought that's a powerful statement from a time 
and a girl who's 18 years old who's saying, keep telling me more because I want to be reminded how much I have to be careful. Um, this, this is something we have to turn the noise up on. Don't turn it down when you hear about a bad story involving the internet because you think you're going to protect your kids from the things that are happening. Just tell them, tell them the truth. Because the truth is, is that this exists, that there are predators out there. There are evil people looking to harm our kids and they can do it without ever having to put a physical hand on them. And it is, it is horrifying what we are seeing on the internet. These images are graphic, they are brutal, and, and the kids are unsuspecting, so. Funny, Matt, because my, my 12 year old overheard our Zoom conversation preparing for this because I was yep. at home and later that night at dinner and Matt knows my son, but he said, uh, mom, you, you know, you were, I heard you guys talking about um, like the internet safety and the gaming. He's like, why would someone try to reach out to a kid on gaming and meet up with them? Like, why would that happen? And he's 12, right? So, and he knows a lot because of the work I do. I said, because some people want to do bad things to kids, right? And right. so they make friends with you on the internet and he go, and then they try to meet up with you in person to do bad things. He said, well, who would meet up with someone they don't know? And I said, a lot of kids would do that. And sure. so, you know, um, having that conversation, it's hard to say to him, some people want to do bad things to kids because I don't want him to know that about the world, but he needs to know it, right? And kids need to know it, even though it's harsh. If they're old enough to be on the internet and gaming and surfing around and looking at sites, they're old enough to know that there's dangers out there. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm glad you said that. That's absolutely true. Uh, Susan, too, just so some people can understand a little bit of these resources, I'll sort of just give you a kind of an overview of why we provided them today. I think it might be relevant. So it's a huge plug to our task force, obviously, but uh, the New Hampshire ICAC.org uh, page, you can go there and we have information about what we do and who we are. Um, we put stuff on there and we're obviously in a stay at home situation now, but people can go there when that gets lifted and we, and we hopefully someday soon get back to having traditional uh, public meetings, they can go there and collect a, a click on the box and have a public presentation done at their local school. And if they're looking to do a virtual one, they can still go there and make the request and explain that. And we'll see if we can accommodate. Um, we always try to help if we can. So that's why that's there. Our Facebook page is actually really getting busier and busier now more than ever. I love it when people go out there and check out what we have on there because we post a lot of great uh, weekly tips and information about what's going on with the internet. We talk about our, our, our partners in law enforcement and beyond that are working with kids, people like yourself and all the other people who are trying to help make a difference. So, you know, that Facebook page is a great place to go and get information and you can learn a lot about what's going on. On the national level, uh, missingkids.org is the National Center for Missing and Exploited Kids. They're the people who manage the cyber tip line, which is also listed below. There is unlimited resources on statistics, um, resource guides for parents and great information that they should really be reading up on if they want to understand what's going on on the internet today. Um, and it's a great place to start. Um, below that, you have two other places you can look. Netsmarts.org from Missing Kids or the Netsmarts group. I love them. So on there, there's all kinds of stuff that is uh, teenage friendly. It's younger teens, but it's great stuff. I tell parents, go to Netsmarts. Look at some of the things that are going on in there, participate in some of the online portal stuff that they have, and then go back with your kids and use it as a teachable moment. Parents can do this at home. Teachers can do this online um, because there's all kinds of links. And then if you go to the Kids Smart, which is for the even younger kids, they have videos and cartoons which are designated to design and teach kids how to learn. And they're fun. And it's a great place for teachers and parents to go learn about things there and then introduce it back to their either their virtual classroom or their kids. And they can send them the links to the page and have them go watch the video and ask them what was the lesson in that video today. And we post some of that stuff on our Facebook page as well. So those are some places people can start. This is Stephanie. I just wanted to, um, to jump in for a minute. Um, I put all these resources on our know and tell page as well. So for folks who are, who are watching this right now and trying to frantically write down all these links, you can go right to the knowandtell.org um, website under the COVID tab and all these resources are also there. Um, we also developed, which we didn't mention, um, a media and device agreement form that you can use as a starting point for a conversation with your kids on a lot of these topics that Matt and Nicole just talked about. It's a great um, form that you have to make certain agreements about with your child about how you're gonna use those devices. It, it talks about the photos, it talks about um, you know time limits, the apps and different things like that. And you can adjust it as needed. So that um, media and device form is also on the know and tell Dot org website and right now all these resources are under the COVID um, tab just to put them in a quick spot for because of all the remote learning and things like that that are going on. 
So I just wanted to jump in and, and give you that little plug, but thank you guys so much. Um, I really appreciated this. I learned a lot from this and um, I'm sure that a lot of our, our listeners did too. And I'm gonna go back and I think watch it again too, too like, just like Susan, because um, there were so many good tips in here. So thank you guys so much. You're welcome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole and Matt and Stephanie uh, for providing all of this information, opening up the conversation and, and getting our brains thinking about this discussion and how we're going to move it into the home or into our classrooms. So, and thank everybody out there for joining us today. Um, I encourage you to reach out to um, the resources that you see. We'll also make sure we put this information up on our um, site, our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. So um, thank you so much for watching and, and thanks for joining us today.